things. Okay, so um, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this uh, lecture is going to expand on some material uh, from my previous uh, coverage. Um, uh, and, you know, I would suggest if you do have a chance to um, review that uh, most re recent recording of the lecture as it, as it does have some additional texture beyond our uh, original coverage and some helpful, some diagrams that I hope will be helpful. Um, we're going to be expanding on this issue of profunctors, um, this gateway to understanding um, some uh, exceptionally uh, powerful tools within the software development space on the one hand, and for understanding dynamical systems on the other. Um, uh, they also provide this uh, exceptional mechanism for reasoning diagrammatically uh, about systems and for um, allowing us to uh, characterize in, in sort of a modeling context um, the cost or feasibility or ways of making one thing from another. Profunctors are all about making a B from an A or getting to a B from a starting point of an A. A is needed, A is consumed, um, and B is produced or achieved. Um, and uh, the formalism of profunctors captures in a rigorous fashion, this notion of sort of produces, produced versus consumed or starting point uh, precondition versus produced post condition. Um, and uh, today's discussion, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna remind you of, of some of the highest level elements from, uh, from the previous lecture, but I'm going to, um, then dive into some material that's uh, helpful for, for general understanding and category theory. Um, hopefully most of it will be a, a reminder, but it's also really useful for profunctor uh, application within modeling as tools for, for reasoning about um, the uh, behavior of, um, of connected systems, and particularly um, these questions about making a B from an A. How much does it cost? How, how long does it take? Um, uh, is it possible? And what are the ways of achieving it? Um, so we're gonna be uh, seeing, seeing some, some foundational material for that. I'm also going to talk at, at least uh, at a base, the most basic level um, about some elements of wiring diagrams. Wiring diagrams are going to accompany us um, pretty much through the balance of um, this module, which will be a set of lectures. They're gonna accompany us in a, in a central way in the dynamical systems area, um, but even for talking about things like profunctor optics, and certainly for talking about reasoning about this making Bs out of As um, reasoning, we're gonna be we're gonna be speaking uh, with wiring diagrams as a constant point of comparison. Uh, so we'll be weaving in some basic wiring diagrams, uh, but be cognizant, we'll be cognizant of the fact that um, there's different types of wiring diagrams for different formalisms. And a wiring diagram is not a wiring diagram is not a wiring diagram. We change the axioms of them. Um, of, of our rules and the wiring diagrams rules change as a result. But there's this amazing kind of duality, not in a strict sense, but in a, um, a sense of richness of being able to go back and forth between symbolic notation and operations formally specified in, in you know, equations uh, and wiring diagrams, which reason about them. Um, and those wiring diagrams will be more than eye candy. They'll, they'll really enable thinking, um, reflection on these things. So um, that's where we're going. Um, some of the foundational material today, um, as I say, hopefully it reminds you of material we would have seen very early on. Um, 
even uh, approaching a year ago when we started the discussion group. Um, uh, but uh, it may also, you know, be seen by you and with a new perspective based on where where we've come since. So, uh, with those introductory comments, I'll I'll uh, uh, just dive into it. Um, okay, so uh, we're we're talking today about uh, profunctors, and we're beating a path to this issue of 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 V categories. And and the profunctors and I'm seeing um, had a had a, a very nice diagram uh, ready, but it's uh, yes here we are. Um, so uh, we're sort of uh, further explicating this and getting on to issues with wiring diagrams. We're going to be talking about preorders today and monoids. Um, and monoidal pre-orders, uh, which I don't think you would have seen except in these videos. Um, and uh, this will put us in a position to understand enriched categories um, where we label things with monoidal pre-orders um, and using diagrams to get to this issue of sort of cost feasibility and V pro-functors, um, which are really cool objects and and this will get into this issue of enrichment um that we haven't really talked about but which is a neat notion we'll go beyond thinking just about categories as having objects and uh morphisms where the hom sets between any two objects say between b and c are defined as a associated with a hom set to actually being able to label it, label it with things like cost label it with things like feasibility or how you can achieve it or the, the, the modes of transport by which you can get from B to a C, for example. And um, we'll see that uh, composition and so on of profunctors will give us matrix multiplication. Um, we'll then probably go back and talk about lenses and optics, and then we'll press on with our understanding of lenses to an understanding of dynamical systems as generalized lenses. So that's where we're going. Uh, let's dive into some of today's materials. So I had asked you to take a look at uh, these lectures. These ones are for uh, future. If you haven't had a chance to look at these, it'd be good to do so because I'm drawing very heavily on those and haven't been able to touch on uh, in these slides uh, all the topics discussed. Um, this, if, if you're feeling a bit shaky on pre-orders or post sets, uh, partially ordered sets, um, or you want a reminder on things like joints and meets, uh, I'd advise you to sort of take a look at, at, at this category as well. And um, uh, I'll see if I can circulate these slides. Okay, a, a few central topics here. Um, we talked uh, last time about how profunctors provide us this way of sort of summarizing, um, we can think of it as two things, but all of them have to do with sort of linking up one thing with another. Maybe it's a proof relevant relation between A and B, where A and B can actually be in different categories or in the same category. Um, um, thinking, of it as, as providing a bridge between two categories. It's another way to think of a profunctor. Or as engaging in wayfinding, ways to get from A to a B. Um, uh, or ways of making a B from an A. We taught making an omelet from, you know, from uh, cracked eggs and uh, in sliced cilantro. Um, uh, and that was one metaphor we used. All of these have to do with the fact that we're, we have a starting point or a thing that we consume, a thing that's a precondition um, that's required, uh, the A, and we're trying to produce or achieve something, a B. And this is absolutely central to the notion of profunctor. Um, we don't associate that semantics with, uh, for example, most functors, um, but we'll see that functors um, 
covariant functors and contravariant functors uh, fit into the pro functor um, uh, context very, very nicely as sort of, uh, they, they each have their place in it. Um, now, monoids um, are going to be a, a foundational concept here that I'll remind you of. Basically, they capture binary combination with a unit element. And so it might be plus and the unit element is zero, or it might be times and the unit element is one, or it might be categorical product and the unit element well, in it would be would be the um, uh, the initial object. Um, excuse me, the terminal object, um, like a singleton set taking the Cartesian product with any other set will be that other set, et cetera. Um, for a string uh, append, it would be an empty string, um, the, this unit element. Um, and it turns out monoids provide us this way of reasoning about parallel paths, because we can combine two things into one. Um, we can reason about how it sort of handles these two and, and produces one. Um, Pre-orders will capture ordering. And this is very closely notion of uh, tied in notion of a post set, a partially ordered set, where really they just differ with each other in the sense that one collapses the things that are isomorphic in another. In one case, um, if A is less than B and B is less than A, then A equals B. In the other case, they can be distinct, but still have this nice property. Um, but they're kind of joined at the hip. Um, monoidal pre-orders will, will capture features of both and, and capture monotonic combinations. So um, while monoids cap, capture binary com combination, uh, in and of themselves, they don't capture ordering um, between things. But with a monoidal pre-order, we have this ordering and the binary operation A times B has this nice property of being monotonic. So um, if A comma B is less than A prime comma B prime, then the combination of A and B with you know, A tensor B, um, this, this like multiplication of them will be less than uh, A prime comma uh, tensor B prime. Wiring diagrams, will be this visual way to characterize operations on any of these. Um, and we'll see them really come into their, uh, you know, start coming into their, their some of their biggest strengths with monoidal pre-orders and monoidal categories. And then finally, there's this notion that the axioms you impose shape the wiring diagram semantics and the, and the semantics associated with this. So, so for example, um, we have the discard axiom or the symmetry axiom or the duplication axiom that says we can costlessly duplicate or costlessly throw something away or, or costlessly sort of exchange two things. Um, okay, so, so these are some uh, topics here that were covered. I wanna provide just a, a brief review of, of pro uh, because I think there's, or, or of what we've covered thus far, because there were some points that um, sort of I should have made more more closely. So just as a reminder, with a covariant functor, we we have a bunch of stuff, and uh, if we have a function that maps from b to b prime, we can turn a list of b into a list of b prime. So maybe b is int and b is uh, b prime is bool, and we can turn a list of ints into a list of bools by hitting each element of the list with this function g. So if we lift g to apply between the functor mapped, you know, the functor mapping of b and the functor mapping of b prime, it'll go in the same direction. Lifting g will, will turn a list of b into a list of b primes. Um, we've got these b's on hand and we can apply g to them and get a list of b primes. Uh, wait, yes, um, yeah. Yeah, just uh, quick it, in your note there oh, on the on the leader, it says type A. You uh, provided oh, zero or more values of type A note back. This, oh, this oh figure. type B. Thank you. Thank should you. that be that a B? Be, that should be okay, B. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I went through and I re, re labeled them to, 
to avoid confusion in the subsequent thing. Thank you so much. That's really very helpful. Yeah. Um, in fact, I corrected it here, but not there, evidently. Um, uh, okay. Um, and, you know, an example of this that we saw was actually with functions. Um, uh, wait, do you have another question or is your hand just still um, sort of in history? I, I yeah. thought I lowered it. It may not have yeah. propagated. Sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. So um, when we have a, oh, okay. Now it says raised your hand again. That's interesting. Um, uh, so yeah, there's no new be, question. You can you can go ahead. Okay, okay. So here with a um, another example of a covariant functor involved in involved functions, right? Where we have a function that requires an environment variable to do its job and returns a b. We have that in hand, and we have a function that maps b's to b primes, and we need a function that goes from environment variable to b prime. And well, if we get an e n um we, we how do we get a b prime well what do we have at our disposal we have something that produces b's well that will at least get us to a b but it won't get us to a b prime so we can plug in the e to this get a b and then what do we do well wait we have something that can map sorry a b to a b prime with g and and that will get us the b prime we need so here we're given this we're given this and we can make use of them together to produce one of these. Um, uh, and once again, it goes in the same direction. We're mapping from a reader B to a reader B prime, just like G is from a, a B to a B prime. Um, and we're lifting this to apply to this. Um, and a key point is that G here, we post compose with this. So we, in order to get the B prime, we first do this and then we apply G at the end. With a contravariant functor, you know, we're, we're not producing a B or producing a B prime here. Um, we're not seeking to produce a B prime uh, and we have something that already produces B. Instead, we need something that takes a B prime. It's like a negative A prime, excuse me, A prime. It, it's like a negative A prime. We need an A prime. Um, and we don't have something that produces an A prime uh, here we have something that takes an A. Um, and so, okay, the idea is, okay, if we have something that, that starts with an A prime, how are we gonna make use of this? Well, um, over here, we have something that will take an A and produce a B. We want, we want to produce a B. We have an A prime, but this thing, this thing produces a B, but we need an A to plug into it. How are you gonna get the A? Well, we need something that goes from an A prime to an A. And that's what this is, right? Um, so we have this, uh, this um, morphism or here function F uh, that goes from an A prime to an A. And by hitting it with this A prime with F, we get an A and we can get a V back and return it. So here we pre-compose this thing with F. In other words, we perform F first to map to an A, and then we perform this. With this one, we perform G after this, because we need to map, but here we hit it with F first. And F is in the opposite direction of this, right? Um, so that's why we call it contravariant. F goes from A prime to A, but we, we produce something going from this to this. And, and the analogies, I gave two analogies, right? Uh, so one of them involved, you, um, you have a recipe of how to make an omelet on the pan um, from uh, cracked eggs and sliced cilantro. Um, and you wanna make an omelet which goes from whole eggs and fresh cilantro um, uh, and in order to do that, we need a way of turning the whole eggs into cracked eggs and the whole, the, the fresh cilantro into sliced cilantro. And then we can use this recipe. Um, and that will get us the omelet we want, the V here. So that was the analogy I gave, um, on that side. We need, uh, uh on the, the omelet side. Another analogy I said is, you know, you have a bus, say, which goes from Place Riel to the airport, 
you're at home and you want to go to the airport. So you don't need the Place Riel to come to you. You need to get to Place Riel to take that bus because um, the bus leaves from Place Riel. So if you want to go get a get from your home to the airport, given a bus from Place Riel to the airport, you need to get from your home to Place Riel, and then you can use this. Um, and so I argued this is kind of part of our intuition in daily life when we go about using things that need have a precondition. They have a requirement. They have a starting point. They have something they consume. We know we've got to give it what it needs to consume. And so if we consume something, if we're given an A prime, we need to give this an A and therefore need to turn this into that. Um, uh, okay, so um, let's talk about how this, that was just a reminder. Um, uh, let's talk about how this applies to profunctors. So the picture with profunctors as a reminder is quite, uh, quite simple at a certain, or similar at a certain level. With a functor, we lifted, you know, we, we lifted morphism here or here function um, to operate between the mappings of these ones. So we had a function here um, that we lifted. Um, so, so if we have types B and B prime, let's say, we, we can map them with the functor to list a B and map this type or object B prime to list of B prime. And then if we have a morphism between these two things, we can lift it to be between the functor mappings of those types, be list of B to list of B prime. So this is our generalization of G to operate on lists, right? And so it was, whether it was uh, covariant or contravariant, the same basic idea. It was just this, func this function was in the reverse direction. And we have the same basic picture here. We, we basically have something that's mapped as an object via the functor. So there's this kind of source object as the functor, the target object as the functor. We map them with the functor. And then we can lift these mappings between source and target down here in the type domain. We lift them to generalize them to operate mapping the profunctor mappings of these objects. That's the idea anyway. Uh, mm. So it differs in its particulars though. First of all, we don't just have one object. We actually have a pair of objects. And well, you could say that's really an object, a single object in the product category. And that's true, A cross B. It's a pair of A and B. You could think of this being a pair of A and B and the, the functor here, which is a profunctor, maps that over into the, in the set domain most commonly, otherwise the B category domain. So, so this is the functor applied to this pair. And here's another pair. We apply the functor to that object and get the functor applied to that pair, just like we applied the functor to this object and to that object. And now we want to go lift something that maps between this, these objects to map between this. How are we going to do that? Well, we, we do that with this thing, die map. Um, and instead of lifting one thing, we lift two things. There's one thing going A prime to A and another thing going B to B prime. And this may seem really confusing, but it's worth keeping a few, a few things in mind. A is the starting requirement here. It's the starting point. It's, it's what we need to do the job. It's, it's um, you know, the thing we consume. B is the finishing result. And you should, it's very useful to think of this, the profunctor is a way of turning an A into a B, um, a way of making a B from an A or getting to B from A. But way of turning an A into B, I think it's kind of nice. And therefore, this is way of turning an A prime into a B prime. And the key notion is A prime is kind of upstream of A. So this is like your home. And this is like a bus from Place Riel to the airport. This is, you want to get from your home to a particular terminal in the airport. B prime is downstream of B. And so 
you're in your home. How are you going to take, how are you going to use this bus that goes to the airport to, as part of helping you? Well, you have to get from your home to the bus and to plus real. Okay. So that's, you have to go from A prime to A. Um, and then the bus will take you to the airport bus stop, but then you need to go from the bus stop to the terminal, B to B prime. Um, so here uh, we are seeking to kind of extend um, uh, A upstream and extend B downstream. Um, so F here is contravariant. It goes from A prime to A to get you into the position where you've got what this needs to, to start and then to go from B to B prime, okay? Um, and F is prepended, it's, it's sort of precomposed. We, we need to get this done first so it can do its job and, and G is postcomposed, it's done afterwards. Um, so you can think of die map as turning ways of turning A's into B's, given a particular way of turning an A into a B, a particular bus from uh, Place Riel to the airport. You now have a particular way of getting from your home to the terminal in the airport. So in general, die map turns, this is a set, it maps this set, each of which is a way of turning an A into a B, into a way of turning an A prime into a B prime. Hmm. This will be really useful for profunctor optics if you think about it that way. Okay, um, so it kind of extends it in both directions. And this is very heuristic, but um, maybe it'll help you understand it. Look, if, if we have this ways of turning Bs into Cs, the HOM set, this is for the HOM functor in particular, which is kind of a canonical one. It's a profunctor. Um, and this is ways of turning Bs into Cs, going from a B to a C, right? That's what the HOM functor is it, of, of, uh, applied to B and C. It tells us ways of, you know, the, the set of all morphisms from B to C. Um, what, what lifting the HOM functor with F shown here from A to B and H from C to D gives you is something that will generalize upstream with F and downstream with H. So if we had a way, a particular way of turning a B into a, a, a particular way of turning a B into a C, in other words, a member of this HOM set, now we get a member of the HOM set from A to D because we have F and then whatever the member was here of B and C that we're dealing with and then H. So now we're, we have a way of getting from A to D, okay? So if the member of this home set was how to turn a, you know, how to turn the, how to turn cracked eggs and sliced cilantro into uh, an omelet on the pan, um, then what you get out is a way of taking whole eggs and fresh cilantro and turning it into a Japanese style sliced omelet with sriracha sauce. You've extended it upstream to allow you to take whole eggs and slice cilantro and whole cilantro or fresh cilantro. And you've extended it downstream by slicing it in Japanese style and putting sriracha sauce on it. Great. Um, and so the job of the, the profunctor is to kind of lift it in this way. Um, it'll lift it to go from A to D instead of just from B to C. It kind of extends it in both directions. This is heuristic because the mapping actually takes place in set. So let's talk about that. So um, we, we spoke about how um, profunctors are this um, mapping from C op across D in general into a category V but most commonly it's uh, C op cross D into set. And here we're gonna look at the HOM profunctor, which is very specifically C op cross C into set. Um, so this is C, the same C here. Um, uh, and the HOM profunctor, um, 
to unpack this a little bit, it's operating on C up cross C. And so um, when we have something like this that maps an, a pair of A and B into a pair of A prime B prime mm, um, in C up cross C, then what it will do is turn that into a mapping. This will be a functor. The profunctor is a functor from this category into set. Here's set. This is this category. If we have an object C A comma B and an object A prime comma B prime, the hum functor, the, the hum functor will map that into set. So A comma B turns into C of A comma B. This is the set of morphisms, the hum set of A and B. It's a set of morphisms between A and B. It's a set. It's a set, right? It contains certain morphisms. Great. And if we map A prime into B prime, this is a set uh, that, of things going from A prime to B prime. That's kind of the upstream and the downstream ones. OK. And then remember that functors are functorial. They map morphisms, into morphisms. So what is this morphism? This is a morphism in C op cross C. A morphism in this goes, if there's an element that goes A to A prime and B to B prime, then it's a morphism from A comma B to A comma, A prime comma B prime. Okay, so we map this morphism into this a morphism here. Remember when we map functors, if we have this one mapped to this object and this one mapped to this object, and we have a morphism between those two objects, it has to map to a morphism between those two. So, so this object got mapped to the home set from A to B. You could think of it as like that. This one got mapped to the home set between A prime and B prime. You could think of that as the, the whole thing here. And this got turned into a function from one to the other. It says for each element of this, for every one of these, we get a specific way to get from A to D. For every recipe of how to make an omelet from cracked eggs and sliced cilantro, you get, you can produce through the magic of the hum functor by lifting F and H, you can produce something which goes from a Crack from whole eggs and fresh cilantro to a sliced omelet with sriracha sauce. Mm. Um, that's exactly what this mapping is. Now, just to explicate this a bit more, this is in C up cross C. What is this in C cross C? Well, it's something like this. We, we have something that goes from A prime to A and C. And B to B prime and C as well. That's why in Hask we're, we're passing in for DIMAP two functions. One goes from A prime to A and the other goes from B to B prime um, because we're operating in Hask, which is in kind of C. So we pass these in, but in C op cross C, these go in the same direction. There are morphism between this object and that object. Um, there's only a morphism between two objects in a product category if there's a morphism from each component to the other. This, the, the first one of this one to the first one of that, and the second one of this one to the second one of that. And so this is a morphism and it gets mapped to a morphism itself, which maps home set to home set. In other words, extends every one of these with a particular one of these, where we, have, we do F first, and then we do whatever one we add from here and we go on. Mm, okay. And so this leads to this to this situation here. And I don't want to go into this um, you know, in detail. We talked about it some last time about some of the reasoning. But basically, if you have this category C op cross C, um, it's it's all the pairs of objects here and all the pairs of morphisms. Um and so something like B cross C, we have B, C. And what do we, can we get to from B, C? Well, we could take F to A, uh, for example, um, B cross C. If B in the first component, where that's in C off, we can take F, okay? We could take F to go to A, 
So if the B can go to an A, okay. And then we have C as the second component. What can we take from there? Well, we could take H to get to a D. So, so that would be a C to a D. So we can go B to an A and C to a D. So there's a morphism here. If you put these two things together, um, there's a morphism from B down to A and C to D. Oh, it's this one right here. So this is linked to this in this category because we can get to it through F pair with H. The F allows us to take the B to the A, the H allows us to take the C to a D. Okay, that will get us to an AD. And you might say, well, yeah, okay. So what about it? Okay, well, <laughs> I don't know if this will lend you more confidence, it's worthwhile. But remember that this category is being mapped into set. So here we have this category and each of these gets mapped to a particular set. What set does it map, map to? Well, B cross C gets mapped, follow the little blue line to, to the HOM set from B to C, okay? This guy, which we went to, A comma D gets, uh, gets mapped to the HOM set between A and D. Hey, that's just that HOM set we were talking about here. It's the two sides of the HOM set. B and C and A and D. So in one case, we have B to C, the, the, the hum set in C, that's this one, all the, the elements there. And this other one, AD is for this one. It's all things going from this to this. And you'll notice that, that this functor maps B to C and maps uh, A, this A cross D into A comma D, okay, great. So, so this represents all the set. This is a set, this is a set here. So this is a set and it's the set of all morphisms from A to D. This is the set of all morphisms from B to C. Okay, yeah. Well, the morphism between them from B cross C to A cross D, the morphism between them, F cross H, is mapped to this morphism. That's the morphism that you get to map B thing, a, a partic each particular thing in BC, each particular element of this um, set gets mapped into a specific element of A to D, to a specific one of this. So notice that's F cross H. In other words, lifting F and H with die map turns into a mapping from B cross C to A cross D. For each one of these, we get one of those. And that's exactly what we did earlier, right? When we mapped with F comma H, we extended this to instead go all this way here. We extended it in both directions. That's exactly what's going on with this mapping here into set. We're mapping this guy into set, and we're extending it in both directions. That's what that morphism is. So the profunctor, this looks hideously ugly, um, but it turns out that it 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 provides this way of of extending and lifting. This means extending it with F on the upstream side. Um, so from B to A. So now we go start at A instead of at B. And on the downstream side, from it extends it from C to D. So we, we end up in D instead of C. Okay, so that's a profunctor. That's profunctor. Um, uh, any questions about that before I start talking about some of these other components here? Anyone want to ask any questions about this idea of kind of extending things that the pro functor accomplishes with DIMAP? Anyone want to ask questions or express puzzlement on that?
No one yet? Okay, so maybe I'll just um, comment on where we're going here. Okay, so um, pre-orders, monoids. These are things we encountered in our discussion group. And it turns out that um, they can be woven together and, and generalized. Um, one thing that weaves them together is something called a monoidal pre-order. This is something which has the features of pre-orders in the sense that it is ordering any two objects can be compared. But it also shares monoids in the sense that it's this way of combining things. Monoids combine things and have this unit element. Pre-orders compare things. And you can get a monoidal pre-order where you can combine and compare order, but where moreover, this way of combining things is, is monotonic. Mm. Um, so uh, that's one way of generalizing these two. Another way is by categories. So instead of having like a, a is less than B, we can, we can actually have a morphism between them. It could be less than, but it could be other things as well. We have much greater flexibility. Um, and in general, we can uh, combine things as well with what's called a, a monoidal category here. Um, and this is, this provides us this degree of flexibility that goes well beyond what these do, but, but generalize it in some very nice ways. But even with these categories, it turns out there's this graphical language associated with each of them. So a pre-order we might write in a sort of a wiring diagram with these boxes and lines. We might write uh, boxes as indicating ordering and the sort of ports into them, the wires associated carry values, carry objects here. And so this would say one is less than or equal to two according to this kind of ordering relation. Um, uh, with monoids, we can kind of capture um, combining of elements um, by having the elements of the monoid be a box. Note that's quite different. Here we have the box being comparison. Here are the elements of the monoid are a box. And um, we have a kind of series, string them along in series to combine them. So if we want to add one and two according or you know combine them in this way, uh, we can do so with this and then you know combine in three, for example. And it's associative, associative. It has to be associative by the rules of monoidality um, to be a, a legitimate full full blown monoid, you have to be associative. You also have to have this unit element. Um, which can be combined with anything else and, and not change it. So it's kind of a, a no-op, a, a no, a sort of a, a operation that doesn't change anything. Okay, then we have this, this category and categories can also be kind of translated into a, a, a semantics of sorts. So here we have morphisms, these are objects, um, and, uh, and a morphism will transform one sort of object into another. And Brendan Fong talks about you know, taking a bar and bending it into a circle and then soldering it to create a ring. Um, so uh, here we have the boxes or the morphisms. Um, now a monoidal category can be illustrated like this. So oh, I should have said a monoidal pre-order we can to, to represent operations, we represent it kind of like this with multiple ports. A monoidal category with this extremely rich way of describing things where we have parallel composition to combine things. Um, and we have these, uh, these uh, ways of having these uh, mappings uh, as well, which can be very useful. So just as a reminder with monoids, uh, with monoids, we had, and this is not 
categorical yet. We had uh, a set and we had an operation, a way of combining uh, elements of that set um, to obtain another element of the monoid. It has to be closed under that. In other words, you can combine any two and get something that's still in the monoid, indeed. Um, and there needs to be associativity. So it shouldn't matter where we put the parentheses, basically. Um, uh, whether they're like group like this or like that is immaterial. It's the same thing. Um, uh, a unit element, uh, this unit element here has to be there such <clears throat> for any other element in the monoid. Combining that unit element with that other element gives the other element back. And you know, here's a bunch of classic monoids. Um, we also have some from programming not shown here, like with strings <clears throat> and string um, appending or or lists and and lists uh, concatenation, etc. Um, or string concatenation and list appending. Probably a better way to put it. Um, and uh, you know, the the unit element is going to depend on how you define your way of of, of combining. Some are maybe less obvious, like max, maximum. Um, for natural numbers, if you take the maximum of zero with anything else, you get that other thing back. Um, and uh, this is a way of combining two elements, A and B. Um, and we have sort of binary equivalents. Um, okay. Um, monoids in programming are very, very common. They are often reified explicitly in APIs. Um, and so we don't have to count on something being combined with plus. We can, we can use any monoidal operation on it. It might be plus, it might be times or, or what have you. Um, now, uh, monoids provide one type of structure and they're nice. Um, Pre-orders provide another sort of structure. And here, again, we're going to be talking pre-categorical. Look, they have a set and they have an order relation. Um, and, uh, uh, and basically, uh, oh, okay, here, here I'm categorifying it. Okay, these are, okay, I got ahead of myself. But um, uh, we have this, uh, in general, we have this set and we have uh, an order relationship uh, between them, um, whereby, um, you know, we can have uh, A is less than B or, or B is less than A. Uh, and for pre-orders, that's, uh, that's sufficient. If we have a post set, a partially ordered set, if A is less than B and B is less than A, we consider them the same. Um, uh, okay. Um, now, uh, it is worth just noting and reminding ourselves that, and this will hark back to some of the work with uh, products, that when we have a pre-order, when we have this sort of ordering, um, the equivalent of product is this thing called meat or the greatest lower bound. Uh, you may remember that um, here um, as having, you know, it's varied, uh, varied definitions. So meat is sort of, the um, the closest upstream side to both of them, and join is the closest downstream side to two objects. Uh, and in various contexts, it um, it's written various ways. So join is equivalent to coproduct, meet to product. Um, uh, in a in a Boolean sense, this is a, a meet is A and B. Um, in a in a Boolean sense, join is A or B. Um, and if we are dealing with sets, we have the intersection of two sets for meet or union of two sets. This is the least upper bound, and this is the greatest lower bound. Um, so um, you may remember some of our pre-orders here. Um, if we have a greatest, if if we if we're going to have a meet, it's the closest 
upstream thing that is close to both. So it would be here the min and the max will be the closest downstream thing is downstream of both. So it will be the, the max um, that comes out of uh, sort of this, uh, this definition. Um, so again, the meat is the greatest element in S that's no bigger than both. Um, and join is the least element um, in S such as at least as big as, as both A and B. Um, so here, uh, the meat uh, is going to be the logical and, and the join is going to be the logical or. Um, join is downstream, but as close as possible. Meat is upstream as close as possible. Um, if, uh, if we add true and true, their meat is true because it's upstream, excuse me, it's, it's uh, yes, it's upstream of both, close, as close as possible. If we had true and false, their meat would be false because it needs to be upstream of both of them, but as close as possible. And we saw that here for, for division and we have least common multiple and greatest common divisor coming out of it. Um, union and intersection, et cetera. Okay. Um, uh, for partitions, here we have join being an agglomeration and meet being intersection between partitions. Uh, with, with agglomeration, if any two of them are, if we consider the two things being combined, if any of them are combined and either of the things being combined, they're combined in the result. That's what we get through agglomeration. With meat, if any of them are separate in either of these things, we separate them in their, uh, uh, in their meat. Okay, um, so that's hopefully a bit of review here, but well, I'll open that up for questions on Monday so you can ask more questions about this. I do wanna just press on to monoidal pre-orders for the final few minutes here. So monoidal pre-order basically combines these two. So it has the features of a monoid in the sense that um, you have, uh, you have a, a way of combining in a unit element, but it also has the elements of a order. You can compare any two um, ordered elements. And it has this way in which they play together nicely by saying, a a tensor B is less than C tensor D if and only if A is less than C and or less than or equal to C and B is less than or equal to D. And that will guarantee that this is, is, um, uh, is less than that. Uh, so this has to be monotonic for it to be a legitimate, pre, uh, le legitimate monoidal pre-order. Beyond that, these things fall out of the normal things for a monoid or uh, for a monoid, really. Um, okay, so that's monoidal pre-orders and some examples of them are here. I'll see if I could supplement some for next time. But um, these are some examples. So with Boolean, we have true and false. Um, uh, we have combination, the tensor, which combine two elements to form a, a, a new element uh, or a, a, an element of the result. Uh, we have implies here. Um, so the question is, you know, does, for example, true imply true is true. True imply false is false. False imply true is true. False imply false is, is true. The, um, the unit is true because, um, if you combine it with uh, any other uh, element here, it will be uh, true. And and then the um, uh, and then the, uh, the 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 way of combining it is is with uh, monoidal and. Excuse me. The, this is the ordering operation. This is the combination operation. This is and. Um, this is monoidal unit. This is the combination operation. This is less than. Um, 
for for benefit, we consider something better than another if it's uh, uh, if if it's greater than the other one. For cost, we consider it better if it's less than than that. The thing on the right is less than it. So um, uh, you have to be aware that sometimes we flip these. Like if cost, if bigger is worse, we reverse the direction of that. And this is why I said the preferred item is kind of on the right. If uh, by default, it'll be the thing here. Uh, if it's larger, it'll be preferred. Um, here, if it's smaller, it would be preferred for cost. Um, and, uh, and then intersection, uh, this is, uh, this is what we have. Okay, so I've gone through this um, uh, very quickly. We have wiring diagram rules that um, that come out of this that we'll cover next time. But basically, we could take a wiring di diagram to encode a certain symbolic relation. This is a tensor B, you, where where this is the product to combine things. This means their combination is less than or equal to C, according to the rule for comparing. Um, this is combining these is less than or equal to D and F. And we have a sort of a unit element. If we combine it with anything else, it's the same as, as not combining it. So, so this is kind of treated the same as that. Okay, so that's... Um, the, you know, uh, a, a very brief glimpse. Where we're going to go is we're going to take these symmetric monoidal uh, elements and have them in symmetric monoidal categories. And then we're going to use them to label profunctor, um, what are called profunctor collages, which are a way of illustrating profunctors as mapping from one category to another. So we'll be able to say, how much time does it take to get from Saskatoon to Calgary and from Calgary to Seattle, and therefore how much time does it take to get from Saskatoon to Seattle? Or maybe it would be um, uh, how much, um, uh, how, how far distant are they? Or maybe it would be, can you get from one to the other? Or maybe it would be, how can you possibly get the different flight routes? We're going to see that with profunctors, we can end up labeling edges with these things through what's called an enriched category and an enriched profunctor, or profunctor mapping to one of these enriched categories. And this will allow us to reason about connectivity in the context of things like cost metrics or feasibility or questions of how we get from one to the other. Okay. So that's all for uh, now. Um, hopefully that offers some um, bit of, um, of re recollection or understanding of the basics of profunctors and uh, a bit of a reminder on the pre-orders and monoids. Um, and uh, we're gonna press on with, uh, with symmetric uh, pre-order categories next time and uh, symmetric monoidal pre-order categories and wiring diagrams. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, take care there.